Well, here we are back in the garage. This place right now is not really a bakery. It's also not really a garage in any way. Uh, it's kind of a mixture of both. Uh, we haven't really been in here very much since moving into our new bakery. It's been a little bit busy on Main Street. Uh, not a whole lot of time for a home, but we've done a lot of projects around the house to kind of restore our home. A lot of things got left unattended while the bakery was here for quite some time. As a result, this place has become part workshop. Uh, there's saws and things lying around. I don't need very much space today. I'm using my bench. I need some water. And then we're actually heading to the home kitchen to bake off the bread. It can be what it is today. And over time, I don't know what this place is gonna be. A lot of people ask us all the time, you know, what are you gonna do with your old garage? Uh, and to be honest, uh, that is still an open question mark, which is exactly where I want it to be. Uh, we've just got a lot of other things going on right now to consider that, but uh, I'm happy to be here for today. Uh, one of the most demanded topics uh, since we started this channel quite some time ago has been to see anything that we do at a home scale. So I actually grabbed a few supplies from the bakery because I didn't have what I needed here. Uh, so all this just came in a couple crates from the bakery today. I've got a couple Bannetons. I've got a little bit of Harriet, our sourdough starter, ready to go uh, at a mature level. Uh, I have some rice flour, some salt, some regular table flour. I've got my proof blend whole grain flour that I'm gonna make the bread with. I need to get water and that's it. Flour, water, salt, starter are just the four ingredients that I need. I'm gonna be hand mixing today. At the home level, I don't find the mixer to be as valuable. Uh, I think it's really nice to get into a hand mixing routine until you're making, well, I'd say more than 60 loaves at a time. Uh, up to that level, uh, hand mixing is about as efficient. Maybe it's a little bit messier uh, for you, but it also, I think, is something that gives more feedback uh, and, and you learn a little bit more hand mixing. I've got my thermometer here, and I need to fill up with some pretty warm water. The difference between hand mixing a couple loaves, which is all I'm gonna make today, two loaves, uh, versus mixing hundreds, is that my batches, which are typically divided into 16 loaves in a bin, hold temperature a heck of a lot better than two loaves will. And so I'm going to start with much warmer water than I'm mixing at the bakery these days. I think this is a really easy mistake to make uh, is to mix too cold. So in Fahrenheit, this water is currently temping at 112 degrees. And I'm gonna say that's pretty solid for what I want. How am I coming to that number at all uh, is a factor of all the other temperatures around me. So we are in Phoenix, uh, and if it was summertime right now, I would have a different opinion. Uh, my ambient temperature in this uh, garage space would likely be a lot higher. It's currently in the 60s outside and in this space, uh, probably low 60s. And so everything is going to be cooling to that level uh, once, once I combine uh, all of my ingredients together. So I want my water to be nice and warm to counteract that. Uh, currently, I'm getting a final reading of about 111 degrees. And I don't need this much water, I just simply brought a decent volume of water because I'm gonna end up using it uh, as I handle the dough anyway. So it's okay to have a bucket nearby with some water in it. Next, I'm gonna just simply uh, tear this small bowl on the scale and get 570 grams of this water into the bowl.
577 was my final number. I'm not going to scoop out those seven grams. I still have a few remaining little tools around here. This place was supposed to be like 98% emptied out, which is like 90% emptied out. We wanted enough that we could still make something here. Problem is like we ran out of supplies as we ramped up to the holidays there. So this place got raided a couple times in the fall, leaving just about nothing behind other than the equipment that didn't come with us to the bakery. I'm getting 850 grams of proof blend flour. That is our kind of custom blend, if you will, of local heritage grains milled by stone uh, at our local mill, Hayden Flour Mills. So I'm adding 850 grams of that to my 570 grams of water. It's not super hydrated. Uh, before you factor the sourdough starter, it's in the low 70s. Of course, sourdough starter is one to one flour to water. So once I add my sourdough starter, I'm going to actually increase the hydration of my loaf. Right now, it's just about getting flour and water together. That's all you've got to worry about when you start bread. This is called the auto lease, and we've gone over this in scale on several other videos in the past. But basically, by bringing flour and water together, I'm releasing enzymes from the flour uh, and beginning the, more importantly, really, beginning the strength building process of gluten. As I'm working by hand, I have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, developing dough is uh, significantly easier when you use time uh, as your aid. So you can develop dough mechanically in a mixer or by hand, or you can develop dough, aka develop gluten, um, with the use of both time and uh, hand mechanics. Uh, the latter being a lot easier. Uh, and also, consequently, better as far as the bread is concerned. Uh, when you develop bread gently, uh, you can take it through this long fermentation process. Uh, and at the end of the day, the final bread that we're eating when it's a long fermented sourdough is significantly easier for our bodies to digest. Uh, during part of the passive process, I can sort of draw out a chart of what happens with, um, with gluten as, uh, as it's developed. So right now during this autolyse, all I am trying to do is bring the flour and water together. It's a pretty gentle mix. It's not uh, super long. The moment that I no longer have any clumps of flour that I can feel that are beyond the size of, let's say, a centimeter, uh, I am going to stop, which I've really gotten to that point already. What I see below me is uh, mostly just dough at this point, uh, albeit shaggy dough. Uh, I don't have much raw flour uh, to be seen at all. And I'm going to focus on any potential raw flour in here and just see if I can work it in as I'm cleaning my hands of the remnants. There's two, two loaves in here, and uh, I don't want to take half of it with me uh, when I go wash up. We are going to go through a more extensive uh, mix to finish. But first, we're going to let this go for 20 minutes. Uh, this is what I would consider to be the bare minimum time for an effective auto lease is 20 minutes. Uh, and during this time, you'll notice the difference in the dough. So what I'm going to do next is just simply sp spray off my hands and then interact with the dough to show you about how much the development has happened up until this point. Sorry to say you probably don't have one of these sprayers at home. Uh, so I'm still taking advantage of the fact that my home does. Uh, I remember when we first put in uh, a sprayer like this, because we didn't always have one here. It was just a game changer because for the first time I didn't constantly like have to touch things with dough. You know, we had not a whole lot of people. Sometimes it was just me and Amanda. Uh, 
And so you've got multiple things going on, an oven timer going off, something needs to come out of the fridge, you know, so on and so forth. And meanwhile, you're hand mixing like we were for a long time. What do you do uh, when you're hand mixing and then you've got to go to the oven to reset a timer? Uh, the sprayer was a game changer in that regard. So all I'm going to do now is uh, basically get a nice smooth top. And depending on the climate that you're from, you might choose to cover your bowl. Uh, once again, I don't want to lose heat, A. Uh, and uh, B, I don't want to dry out uh, the dough at any point during this process. So I've got a couche cloth here. And I'm going to go ahead and put this into as warm of a spot as I can find. So usually right above your home stove, especially if it's turned on, like ours is right now, uh, is a nice warm spot. Uh, again, it's winter time and uh, everywhere around me is going to cool this dough, which is not what I want. I, I want it to actually stay as close to 84 degrees as possible at the final mix. So I started with that really warm water and now I'm going to take it at least 20 minutes during this auto lease section and just let it rest. Meanwhile, I'd like to draw your attention to the sourdough starter, uh, which is going to be added to this dough right after the auto lease is done. We only have two ingredients left, the starter and the salt. For one, I want to make a debate of whether sourdough starter is truly adding an ingredient because it's comprised of flour, water, and microbes. Certainly the microbes are the added ingredient, if you will. But as far as the dough is concerned, it is one with the dough already, except it's a wetter dough. And so it will make your overall dough wetter as you put it in. That's logical. And that's an important point because as you adjust formulas and build your own breads, uh, whatever they are, especially if you're going from say a bread that you really love and you make it with yeast and trying to bring it into a sourdough formula, the biggest factor is that your sourdough starter is wet usually and so you have to adjust some of the other ingredients as a result. So if I'm going to make a formula with sourdough, then I'm going to assume the value of the sourdough starter into the flour and water values. So just to draw this out, Suppose I have a yeasted loaf that takes 800 grams of uh, flour and takes 550 grams of water, usually. So that's one particular hydration that I can calculate simply by taking the water and dividing it by the flour. So the 550 is the water, and here you have flour. So I'm going to take 550 and divide it by 800 and get a, a value of 68% hydration. Uh, so if you ever read out on, online or in books about uh, hydration in a bread loaf, it's simply how much water there is in comparison to flour, with flour being a whole and water being a percentage of that whole. Now I'm going to introduce a sourdough starter. Typically, when you make a sourdough bread, just a strict uh, artisan sourdough country loaf, meaning just flour, water, salt, no added butters or milks or added inclusions, 20 to 30 percent of the flour in starter ratio is about right. So in this case, if I say go 0.25, so 25 percent of 800, then I'm going to have 200 grams of a sourdough starter, Harriet. Let's figure out now how the hydration is impacted with that 200 grams. So this 200 gram sourdough starter is made up of 100 grams of flour and 100 grams of water, which means I'm going to add the 100 grams of flour to my flour count and the 100 grams of water to my water count. Now, to find out the new hydration, I need to take 650 grams of water and divide by 900 grams of flour. And so my actual final hydration for this loaf is 72.2%.
This formula is very close to the one that we're using today. I mostly used round numbers here to make it very easy for you to see how to both convert uh, a different recipe into sourdough, but to get the base percentages for a country loaf, about 20 to 30 percent of sourdough starter to flour, typically in the 70s for water, although it will vary depending on the flour that you're using. And then the final ingredient, salt, I like to aim for two and a half percent salt. So I'm going to go 0 0.025 times my 800 grams of flour. And that leaves me with 20 grams of salt. So that's as easy as it is to build a sourdough formula. And that's the way that I think about recipe building is percentages to flour. Those are called baker's percentages. And this is another way of thinking about what are baker's percentages. So now we know how much of Harriet I'm going to be adding to my dough today and how much salt I'm going to be adding to my dough today. But going into the actual sourdough starter in depth. So I'm giving my starter a smell. I'm looking at the texture of it, meaning I'm assessing kind of the bubbles on the side, just getting an idea of what I'm using. This starter came from the bakery and it was a by hand refresh that was done yesterday. This starter was stored at peak maturity in the walk-in cooler. And you can tell that it is still mature, but it is beginning its receding portion. So I'm gonna draw basically the curvature of how a sourdough dough of any kind, whether it be a starter or an actual bread dough develops. And it looks something like this. Where this is point zero, meaning the mixing point. It grows and develops, which is another way of saying that the colony of microbes, the wild occurring yeasts and lactobacillus bacteria that cohabit a sourdough starter, uh, multiply exponentially for the first few hours. So this is this exponential curve. Then they reach a point of stasis where they basically level off, no longer expanding, meaning no longer multiplying and dividing as cells. The stasis lasts for a little while and then it experiences, the dough experiences a recession or a cellular death of the microbes in the sourdough starter. Every sourdough follows this curve and it starts with the actual starter itself. Uh, if you think about this curve as cell colony uh, of your sourdough starter, it's the best way of thinking about how to build a good bread. So when I mix, whether it be my sourdough starter or my bread dough, I want to be mixing in this range where the sourdough starter or dough are at their peak, meaning the maximum amount of cell colony in my microbes exist at that time. This particular sourdough is probably somewhere close to the top but on the declining side. And it's still okay to mix with. But when it comes to the regular care of your sourdough starter, which is something that is often underestimated, uh, you want to be regularly getting the cell colony in your sourdough starter to climb. People ask all the time, well, how often do I feed a sourdough starter? And is it okay to keep it in the fridge and just use it out of the fridge? My particular opinion on this is that, yes, absolutely use the fridge, but don't forget about your sourdough starter, which is a living set of organisms in your fridge. And don't expect that the refrigerator is somehow some sort of a magic life giver to your sourdough starter. It is a preservation method at best. And as a result, when the sourdough starter enters that cold environment, it is going to begin a slow decline, much slower than if it were kept at ambient temperatures, but nonetheless, it's going to begin a decline. So if you feed your sourdough starter, uh, put it in the fridge, uh, the timing that it goes in that cold environment matters too. So 
if I have this relatively small amount of starter, which is, a, it's mature, remember, so it's probably only about 1,000 grams, in, even though it's showing about the two liter mark. And let's say I feed it to that level, but I immediately refrigerate it. What's gonna happen is that the cell colony is not going to get a chance to expand fully and multiply because I'm lowering the temperature. And by lowering the temperature, I'm reducing the overall microbial activity. Uh, so 84 degrees Fahrenheit is a really good balance between the lactobacillus and the wild occurring yeast in your sourdough, which is what a sourdough starter is comprised of. You want to feed your sourdough starter to 84 degrees, and then you want to let it be at that level for at least four to five hours if you feed on a one to two ratio. That's what I want to get into next. When you feed a sourdough starter, it is typically done by taking half the amount of mature starter and adding one time the amount of flour and water. So if I have 100 grams of mature starter, then I'm going to add 200 grams of flour and 200 grams of water. And I'm going to mix it together just like I did on the auto lease, just to the point of incorporation. And I want to end with a temperature of 84 degrees, then sustain that temperature for a number of hours. I would say at least five before starting to refrigerate. Uh, at eight hours of ambient temperature is typically the edge of stasis. It's typically around here on this curve. And so eight hours is a good time to feed it again and get another exponential rise in cell colony. So what I'm trying to argue here is that if you feed your starter multiple times before you mix your dough, you're going to have a more robust sourdough starter than if you feed your starter once or don't feed it at all coming out of the fridge. I would recommend to pull your sourdough starter one day before you intend to make bread. So it's hanging out in the fridge, you pull it out, you feed it, just like I described, a one to two ratio. You let it sit on the counter for eight hours. You feed it a second time later that day, and then you mix with it the next morning. That second time that you feed it, you can intentionally put it in the fridge right before bed. So feed it, let it go for four to five hours, and then put it in the fridge. It will be nice and mature by morning. That's a pretty good rhythm. You're gonna to have to figure out what works for you because everybody is going to have a slightly different relationship with their starter. There's also more variables, uh, which we've described in other videos. I am assuming that you're feeding your sourdough starter with a white bread flour, and again, you're doing the one, two, two refresh. If any of that changes, some of this information will change along with it. So that's a little bit about the starter. I have let some time pass for my auto lease now. So I've been letting this auto lease go for a little while in a warm spot. And now it's time to grab this dough, go back to the bench and complete the mix. So we're gonna head back there now. It's time to complete this mix. Before I start, I wanna kinda of get a parameter of all of my ingredients. So first my auto leasing dough. Let's see how well I preserve the temperature here. It looks to be temping at about 92 degrees right now, 93. And I'm pretty happy about that because as I hand mix it for the next 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, it's going to actually drop in temperature. And then it's gonna keep dropping in temperature just because the ambient environment around here is not 84 degrees. Another cause for the drop in temperature is the fact that my sourdough starter is temping in the low 60s. And I'm about to introduce that as well to this dough. 59 actually. I wanna take a look at the dough as well before we get much further. When we first started the auto lease, it was barely brought together. So there wasn't a whole lot of strength built up in this dough at all. If you grabbed any piece of it, it would immediately rip apart. 20 minutes later, and this dough actually has enough development to fool you to think that I might have a window pane. I don't, 
but notice the little bit of strength that's just developed on its own, this stretchiness that's developed on its own. I barely did this work. I, you saw how long I actually mixed this dough and it wasn't very long at all. The rest of this was time. Uh, remember the, the bassinage uh, that we do. Uh, so go back in some of the videos that we did on mixing uh, and we're always adding water at the end of the mix. When I'm hand mixing, I'm just gonna do this by getting my hands wet. I need to add the equivalent of 30 grams of water to this mix as it goes. Uh, that's how small this mix is in comparison. Normally I'm adding about two liters of water to my giant bowls like this one. Uh, so to get started, um, I'm going to add my sourdough starter, I'm gonna add my salt, and then I'm just gonna get my hands wet with the extra water that I had. So my sourdough starter, the actual formula here is 170 grams. I used round numbers inside. Just that amount that I pinched off was more than I needed at 240. So I'm gonna grab some of this. There's 160, 171. I'm gonna tear my scale and then add 21 grams of salt. That is not salt, that is rice flour. Now I'm adding the salt onto a lid, well because getting to 30 grams is not that difficult of a feat. And so it's better to weigh this out correctly aside from the dough and then put it in. You don't want to end up salting the dough to 5% salt just by an inadvertent mistake, which you can't really, how are you going to scoop the salt out of the, out of the dough once it's in there? I'm just gonna put it right on top of the starter. Not a big deal, it's going straight into the mix now. So this is the point at which I will get my hands wet and then start working the sourdough starter into the rest of the dough, just simply by dimpling. In doing so, I'm also uh, diluting the salt and within minutes of doing this kind of cat-like kneading action, really within seconds, uh, the salt is starting to uh, dilute. I can feel it. You know, uh, when you first start doing this, you're, you feel all the salt, and already right now I'm feeling less and less salt with every, uh, every bit of kneading. Notice that I'm rotating this bowl around as I'm doing this. It helps a lot. And I'm gonna knead this all the way to the point that this uh, top portion of sourdough starter is decently incorporated into the dough. Uh, if you want another look at a very similar process, we have a video on mixing in inclusions into doughs and it's essentially this exact same process uh, where you have the dough and then you simply knead in the inclusion on top until the point that it starts to incorporate decently in the dough. I'm not gonna get all of it, but enough that it's not so spreadable on the top. As I get further into this, I'm going to start thinking about folding it in on itself. So now I'm gonna fold into the middle. I'm scraping the edges to get any extra material off the bowl, then folding it in on itself, kind of creating a mega sandwich of uh, sourdough starter and dough. And it's roughly from this point that you need to start thinking about getting into a mixing rhythm for quite some time. I would suggest that this would be a great time to grab this bowl, uh, get into a comfortable position. You can stay seated if you like. You can turn on some music in the background. Whatever is going to give you the most sort of meditative approach for this next step. Uh, roughly the length of three songs or 10 minutes, uh, 10 to 15 minutes is what I want to do here. I'm gonna use my 10 or 15 minutes just simply uh, talking about bread making with you all. Uh, but you have to find a way to pass this time and not rush it. 
there is something to be said about just taking the time to develop dough. We do it in the mixer. We are letting time do as much as possible, but there is still an element that we have to bring to the table here. So I've got a shaggy mess and I want to develop into something. Uh, I'm going to grab the bowl with one hand on one side and then use my other hand mostly like a spatula scoop is the best way to put it. I'm scraping the edges as I'm, as I'm kind of diving into the middle and then I'm going to start this motion of trying to pull at the dough, bring it back to the center and develop it in this way. It is perfectly acceptable to be a little bit rough with it. You are doing nothing but developing gluten by stretching and allowing that process to take shape. I'm again still spinning my bowl, stretching, and then letting kind of gravity bring the dough back. As I go, I can en end up over time staying in one spot a little bit more. So you'll notice how this changes over time. Just crank up the music and find a good rhythm. The key is to find a good smooth rhythm by which to do this. Otherwise, if you pause a little too much, well, so, okay. Some of you might not be used to this motion. It might be really hard to maintain this for a while. It is okay to walk away for five minutes and continue. In fact, time will do some more in that, that uh, pause. However, you don't want to avoid this whole process altogether. This is not enough. You can take one look at this dough and see how shaggy the top is. You can grab it and notice how easily it rips. And then if you feel it a little bit more, there's still a little bit of inconsistency. It's not all smooth and silky. So if your hand gets tired in the process, that's okay. Walk away. This is a good opportunity to get your hands wet again. This extra introduction of water is not a bad thing. You'll notice that even in that time that I was away, the dough sort of changed consistency a little. Baking is really, I think, a lot like alchemy. Uh, you are mixing ingredients together, dust and water, uh, and bringing them together into this really interesting food that's both portable and calorically dense enough to feed humanity. It's a really cool overall thing to do and to get acquainted with. I think everybody should learn about bread making at the very least to appreciate better bread in their communities. Uh, it's understandable that this is a lot to sometimes incorporate, but the people that can take it to the next level and incorporate bread making into their home life, I think offer a really interesting uh, extra set of things that uh, connect you to uh, the world around you. You're, you're just an observer of this process that intervenes, but really the majority of the process is happening in the background uh, as millions of microbes are actually working together to leaven your dough. They don't really stop. You get to kind of take breaks in between. So it's a process that I think is uh, worth learning about. So I've been here for a little while now. Uh, doing the same motion, trying to find a decent rhythm. You can probably see that compared to when I started, this dough is significantly stronger. I can stretch it further. And then I'm also using my fingertips, so it's hard to see, but basically my, finger, my hands are slightly open, I'm scooping down, and as I raise, I'm actually kind of wiggling because in doing so, I'm feeling any little clumps and smoothing them out. So hand mixing is a little bit nuanced in that way where I'm trying to work this dough in such a way that I'm developing it. If I try to pass a window pane test right now, I'm getting a lot closer. Did this all by hand with roughly 10 minutes of mechanical action and 20 minutes of passive auto lease time. 
every time that I take a pause, I'm getting my hand very wet and then getting back after the dough. So that's my bassinage, if you will. And I'm going to stop my mix at the point at which that I feel the dough will have a good time finishing just by time. So really it's still a factor of incorporation. Like there's still little remnants of flour. Now they might be just a pebble uh, in size, but I can feel them. And as I'm continuing, I'm feeling less and less. I'm also getting a more extensible dough as I go. There's other methods of doing this. Slap and fold is a, a popular method um, that's a little bit more aggressive to develop dough. Uh, there's the no knead method, which is even more passive than this. Uh, maybe doesn't really factor how well your dough is developed uh, before letting it go passive. Takes advantage of that premix uh, method that we've talked about in the past. Different hydrations call for different mixing styles. So this is a higher hydration dough. If it was a lower hydration dough, I wouldn't really be able to do this action very well. Uh, it might be, you know, a little bit sandier. And so I would have to kind of get in and do the more traditional two-handed knee. So this is not an end-all end -all, be-all solution. Uh, as many hand mixing methods exist as there are different cultural traditions with bread, which there are many. Bread has taken many forms across the world and throughout history. I'm starting to become very happy with this final dough. And let's find out where we landed temperature wise. 77 degrees, 112 degree water. And by the end of the mix, we're at 77 degrees, which is within range. So 84 being ideal, uh, 70 being kind of the edge of the abyss, if you will. If you get below 70, it's going to take forever. So I want to get this back to the warm spot right above my stove. I'm going to cover it up so it doesn't dry out and then bring it somewhere warm. The key is just to preserve the temperature at this stage. So I'm choosing near my stove as my warm spot. I'm not trying to warm up the loaf right now so much as I'm just trying to maintain a good temperature with it. So it's at a decent temperature in the high 70s. If I keep it there, I'm going to be happy and get nice active fermentation. So here it is in this warm spot. So it's time to fold the dough that we mixed, taking it from its warm place and using a bowl of water. It's already risen a little bit since we put it away. I'm going to get my hands wet. I'm not going to be afraid of getting my wrists wet as well. And my folding technique will be a little bit different given that this is a small round bowl. So you've seen us fold in a number of different ways, but really the most important thing first is just to free the dough of the bowl. And in folds, I'm extending the mix essentially. I'm still developing the gluten developing the overall strength of the dough. So I'm going to give it a nice stretch. Notice how much that stretches after just a few minutes of resting. Rotate, give it a nice stretch again. Rotate, and I'm just folding it into the center, rotating the bowl around, and each time I can get a little bit less stretch because I've already folded. I'm almost all the way around. One more to go. And now I'm going to give this a flip over. So my st stretches are all sort of together at the bottom. And now I have one new unified tighter uh, ball of dough. 30 minutes and it's going to expand again and relax. I'm going to come back at this. So back to its warm spot goes. Time for the second fold. So between first and second folds, I go at least 30 minutes. Uh, but 
I would be very careful not to take the times extraordinarily literally from the video or the recipe for that matter or any of these parameters because bread changes individually. Uh, flowers take a little bit more or less water. Uh, timings vary based on your ambient temperature. Uh, and it's more of a matter of building a rhythm with your dough. I'd say 30 minutes because it's a minimum amount of time for the dough to relax. And really you're trying to get more development happening in the passive background before you go and stretch and fold. So imagine gluten is this like matrix, this web uh, of strands. Uh, it's a protein bond between the flour and water. And over time we're basically webbing even more and creating more of that matrix. Every time you go to stretch and fold, you're exponentially adding to the layers of the dough. Uh, stretching out, building tension, and then you're allowing the dough to relax in between so you can come back again and add more layers, more tension. The whole time we're just tensioning this dough so that by the time you go to shape it, it has the ability to hold its shape pretty well uh, before it even goes into the banneton. That's how you end up with a nice uh, loaf at the end of all of this after all. Well, and so as a baker, uh, your goal is to get this dough to be as strong as possible uh, before you go and shape it. Every time you fold, you're adding to its strength. And uh, it's a much gentler way of dealing with the overall strength of the dough. You're basically letting time develop in the background, create more of those strands, and then you're coming along and stretching them, strengthening them, letting them relax, then coming back at it. Uh, that's kind of the rhythm of long fermented baking. So each time I do this, I'm going to loosen the dough from the sides of the bowl and then scoop underneath it, stretch the dough out, and fold it in on itself. And it's even stretchier, more developed now than it was the last time that I went at this. The resistance is called elasticity. The ability to extend it, or I guess the opposite of the resistance, is called extensibility. That's my second fold. Again, I'm just flipping it over to lock that in. Each time my hands are wet, uh, it's much easier to interact with the dough. Y use water as that barrier between your skin and the dough. You can use flour too uh, on the table, but water applies to folding nicely and it also applies to the table and it's less messy than the flour alternative, which you know, gets everywhere. We do both. You've seen us do both at the bakery, but uh, for this process, water will do just fine. So I'm covering the dough and putting it back in its warm spot. I'm going to come back to this dough one more time before shaping it and give it one last set of stretch and folds. Do this once, twice, three times, four times. It can vary depending on the type of dough you're making. We're making what most would consider to be a country loaf of sourdough. And I like the three sets of folds for our particular dough. I didn't get too deep into the flour composition, but it's a type 85 flour mixed with a white bread flour. So it's about 50-50 between white bread flour and a whole grain type 85 stone milled flour. On the whole grain side, we vary those grains in this particular loaf. So there's a number of different heritage and locally grown grains. But the key is to have a nice strong bread flour as a base and then add flavor, nutrition with the whole grain flour. Uh, the combination, I think, yields a superior loaf overall. You get the best of both worlds. The white flour adds a strong structure. Uh, some bakers, uh, borrowing from uh, the sourdough school, Vanessa Kimball, say that the white flour is like a good scaffolding, uh, it's good, good structure for the loaf, good framework. And then the whole grain flour adds almost all the flavor and most of the nutritional qualities of wheat are contained in the bran and the germ, meaning the other portions of the berry that don't represent white flour uh, that are present in that whole grain flour. So anyway, we're gonna give it one last pause and uh, we'll go back, give it one more stretch and then uh, shortly thereafter, we'll be ready to uh, give it its final shape.
made it to the final fold. I've given this dough a couple folds at this point. Get my hands and wrists wet. Loosen it from the bowl. Each time I'm also kind of getting a gauge of where it's at. Is it rising, which it is. It's nice and loose again. I'm going to give it as much strength as I can on this last one. And each time I come at it, it's easier to build tension. So as the dough fills with more gases, uh, for whatever reason, when you go to stretch it, it seems like that uh, effect of stretching it and tensioning it goes a longer way. So I like to give it this final fold uh, straight before we go to shape and make sure that I've developed as much tension as possible uh, going into it. So I'm going to let it relax uh, for another period of time and the next time I go to interact with it, I'm going to actually bring it back to the wooden bench, uh, turn it over. Remember there's two loaves in here, so we'll cut them in half and go through the shaping process. Uh, one of the nice things about having two loaves as well, uh, as opposed to one, is at home at least you get to practice the shaping twice as opposed to one time. The feedback ratio of shaping at home is significantly lower than at the bakery. Uh, if something goes wrong in this process, well, you only have the one or two loaves. So it's going to take a little bit longer to practice and get to results than say if you made a hundred loaves a day. Uh, so be gentle with yourself because this process takes a while to learn. Uh, and honestly, the first few months that I was baking as a, as a baker that was trying to make a living as a cottage baker, I really didn't understand a lot of the nuances that were happening. Uh, a lot of that knowledge came just through building a relationship with dough. So I can't emphasize that enough. Covering this, I'm going to put it back to its warm spot. I've been monitoring in between and checking the temperature. And the temperature is still really close to 80 degrees. I can actually show it to you really quick before we put this away. Because again, where this temperature holds matters greatly. So I'm at 78 and climbing. 79 degrees, so my warm spot is paying off. It's holding the temperature, which is exactly what I wanted. So we're ready for shaping. But before we get to it, I want to get back to this fermentation graph, a sourdough fermentation graph. This being the first part, the exponential rise, followed by the stasis, followed by the cell death portion. It's really important to start to develop a relationship with where your dough is on this graph. And it's unreasonable to assume that you're always going to shape your dough at the exact same moment on this graph. It's not really practical either. After all, baking has to somehow fit within the rest of your life. And there are ways to mitigate depending on where you are on this curve. Uh, this will also be foundational knowledge for other doughs because a key right now before I put the dough away into the fridge is to make sure that there's fermentation activity and by the time I bake, I'm baking somewhere in this range. So I'm going to unwrap my dough and you can see that it's got some gas bubble buildup just in the last five minutes since the last time I took a peek, a lot of activity has happened. Uh, and that's, again, the exponential component of this, which is sometimes really hard to intellectually grasp why later on in the process more is happening than in the beginning of the process. Based on my relationship with my own dough, I'm going to say that we're somewhere here on this curve. And my strategy then is going to be go ahead and shape, assuming that I have other things that I need to do. I could let this go realistically for probably another hour to get to here. 
And that's based on my knowledge of my dough. I'm not gonna give you a very hard line set of timings here because temperature varies the timing uh, and other factors. But it's several hours to get to this point. Uh, in this case, I believe it's been around three hours. Like I said, I could push it another to get to this point. Note that when I put it in the refrigerator, it's not going to immediately um, halt. It's going to actually continue its fermentation and sort of taper off. So it's a slowdown effect. And so it's also important to consider that in terms of your timing. Because of where I'm at on this curve, quite simple. I'm gonna shape these loaves and then put them in the banneton and then leave them out for an hour before I put them away in the fridge. In that way, I'm going to extend the bulk fermentation after it's been shaped, allow the loaf to stay more at that ambient temperature so that more is happening, and then refrigerate. It's perfectly acceptable to take that order as well. If my dough was further along and already in the stasis, well then of course I'm gonna go straight to refrigeration because I don't want to start overproofing my dough, which another way of thinking of overproofing is just simply we've reached this point where basically no matter what you do, the dough is not going to get any more energy. It's already losing its energy. So at that point, even in the oven, not a whole lot's gonna happen. It's gonna stay a little flat and, and squatty. So to get my shaping started, just gonna get my hands wet, loosen up the dough from the edges of the bowl, turn it over onto the bench. And I came out here into the old bakery, mainly because I really love working on the wooden surface. You can work on granite, you can work on metal, uh, you can work on you know composite surfaces as well in, in the kitchen, but all have a different temperature and texture. Uh, uh, the granite and metal being a little bit colder, which is not really something I want right now. So I just flipped it over onto its smooth side, which is going to be the outer portion of the loaf. And then I'm dusting a little bit of table flour just to help my own interaction with the dough, make it a lot easier. There's two loaves here, so I'm gonna go ahead and scale them out. Because there's two loaves, I'm gonna see if I can get pretty close to half. Seven eighty two is one. Seven ninety two is the other. I got pretty close. Ten grams is typically my uh, forgiveness rate at the bakery anyway, so I'm not going to bother to change that out. Because I have two even cuts, I don't really have to pre-shape. Uh, there's enough tension built up on the surface to get a smooth crust. But if this dough looked shaggier or if it was multiple pieces, or even now, it doesn't help, it doesn't hurt rather, to give it a little bit of tension by pre-rounding, setting this piece aside and coming back to it to shape. If you try to shape this right now, it's got too much tension built up so you can't really do it. I'm gonna leave this aside and show you what happens if you don't pre-shape the other one. This one has not had that tension built up so I can actually go straight to shaping. But if my dough was in three or four pieces, then the action of rounding it like this would have incorporated those pieces together and left me with the same smooth surface. Keep in mind, this will be my outer crust in the final loaf. You can compare that to the outer crust here. Similar, which is why I can get away with not pre-shaping this. To shape, I'm gonna go ahead and dust this with a little bit more flour and get a very small amount of flour onto my work surface. Now I'm gonna flip it over. My preferred shaping style does not have to be your preferred shaping style. The end target is a nice burrito looking thing. Uh, you're watching this probably from all over. Uh, Amanda refers to Chipotle burritos because they're like the exact size of our loaves uh, when we're training people. So now I'm gonna stretch 
this mass out into a triangle. I'm going to try to keep it fairly even. And I'm going to fold this top over. From that folded over top, I'm going to grab the, the corners, stretch them out. Notice the common theme, both actions involved a stretch. Now I'm going to fold this part, this left part from my perspective, over the top layer to the point that it's two-thirds over. So think about it in thirds when you stretch it. This other half, I'm also going to stretch two-thirds of the way. So now that center third is here, and that's where my final shape is. I'm going to grab the bottom half now, stretch it out, common theme, meet the end of the first left fold over, and I'm going to take this side and overlap it. I have this weird divot here, so I'm going to stretch this out and fill that. So here we go. The next part is the tuck and roll. I'm going to roll it towards myself tightly and then actually build tension as I go by pressing this side down and into the loaf. Roll again, build some tension. And I can go the whole way. Now I have this log. You can see that it's holding its shape. It's not flopping out. That's all the tensioning that we've done through this entire process up until now, holding form. I'm going to rotate it this way, 90 degrees, and then roll the ends into themselves. And now I end up with my final shape, akin to a pretty fat burrito. You can see it in the shape. You can see it in the final form factor and how much gas buildup there is whether you need to leave it out for a little while. Back to that curve. So I've certainly gotten gas buildup. I've certainly gotten fermentation going. The fermentation sites are all established. Keep in mind, they establish early and they stay there. But those like gas bubbles are really small. And what I want is a little bit more expansion before I cool this down. So now that I have my final form, I need some rice flour. That's going to be my safety barrier between the outer crust of this loaf, which I don't want to ruin, and the banneton. Uh, the banneton that we're using has a linen. The second one does not. Uh, the one that doesn't have the linen is where this really matters. Uh, all these grooves in the banneton are stick points, uh, and regular table flour, wheat flour, will incorporate into the dough the, the actual bread loaf will stick, uh, as described before. So now I'm going to scoop with my bench knife, dip into the rice flour. I really only have to dip the side that's going down. And the seam, meaning the part that I was rolling, is facing me up. So that nice side is the side that went down. That's this very smooth side of the loaf. Now what I'm going to do with this is set it into a warm place. That same place I've been using for my dough, I'm going to let it be there for another hour, then I'll pop it into the fridge and then I'm done. So again, just another passive step that I decided on based on where I found that we were on that curve. You won't know when you first start baking where you're at. And that's why this video comes with a recommendation to bake often and frequently because it's each time that you bake that you get a little bit better at it. It's not just trying it once. This is not a one and go experience. You can if you just want to get a feel for it, of course, but you won't get as much from baking if you only ever do it once. You'll get the most from your relationship with bread and bread making if it just becomes something that you do, even if it's infrequently, even if it's once every few months. Every time you come to this, if uh, you take from your previous experiences and build on them, you'll improve. If you do plan on taking a longer time between, uh, take notes of your observations. And that way, you know, a few months later when you get back to baking again, you can go back to your notes and remember exactly you know, what you learned the first time. Because the trial and error is more valuable than any video, than any formula. Uh, it's in that that this becomes more of an intuitive relationship as opposed to just something that you're doing from a script or from 
uh, from a video. It's always important to get a start, but the real learning will happen on your own. So now I have my pre-shaped loaf, and you'll be able to see how this one performs similar. Uh, I've let it rest. I'm going to again dust the outer surface with flour, flip it over. I'm going to stretch it out to that same triangle. What's nice about the pre-shape is it has more tension built in already. I'm going to have to put in a little bit less work on this entire roll-up process in order to build the same amount of tension. So I've already done some of that. So again, I'm folding the top edge over, extending the top corners, folding this one over, following the seam, taking the bottom edges, stretching, meeting my new loaf's edge, folding over, filling that hole. Now I'm tucking, rolling, and building tension as I go. Once I get to the bottom, what I'm doing is with my thumbs and the heels of my hands up against the table, I'm pushing, and then with the back of my hands and pinkies, I'm pulling to create more tension. Rotating that dough 90 degrees and doing the same thing, pushing with my thumbs, pulling back with my fingertips to create more tension. And then notice that my final loaf doesn't droop in my hand. If it's sitting on the table, it holds its form nicely. But on this curve, like I said, it's not all the way up at that stasis level. I want to push it a little bit further at ambient temperatures before I cool it down. So now I'm going to scoop it, roll it in the rice flour, take that side that I just rolled, put it down in the banneton, and now I have two. The last step of the process for putting it away in the fridge, keep in mind your fridge is going to dry out that loaf. And you don't want to come back the next day and have a tough, dry layer of dough uh, on this underside. You're not going to get a very even bake. So anything that you can do to shield the moisture from leaving the dough, again, a fridge is going to dry it out. So I found this random produce bag and I'm just going to put this whole banneton into the produce bag and then this is what's going to go in the fridge. Again, I'm going to wait some time though before I put it away. You don't always have to do that, depending on where you chose to shape. The timing of your shaping won't matter as much if you are in tune with the fermentation. The timing of, sh of your shaping matters greatly if you will always follow the same rhythm of putting the dough into the fridge afterwards. You gotta make sure that you've built up all of the, the gassing power that you can before uh, bringing the temperature down. So not a whole lot's gonna happen in terms of rise uh, once you drop the temperature into refrigerated temps. This is now a shaped loaf of bread. Once I put it away, I can let it go overnight, preheat my Dutch oven and my oven uh, the following morning, and then get to baking. So this is a way of having fresh bread the next morning. So it's time to bake. At this point, we have mixed, bulk fermented, done our stretches and folds, shaped, put the loaf away uh, in a cold place, a fridge overnight, and now it's time to bake. So I've got my preheated, really hot Dutch oven. It's actually quite important that it's preheated. Your loaf won't turn out if it's uh, not preheated. Uh, it's kind of like an insulated chamber. And, and it's the beauty of these Dutch ovens is that they trap the moisture of the loaf inside generating natural steam. So they replicate our really expensive steam injected ovens with just the cost of some cast iron. I'm going to turn it over from the banneton onto the hot cast iron. And then I need to get my wire monkey lom ready. I should have done that beforehand, but 
It's called a UFO LOM, and bakers particularly love these things. Uh, we certainly do. They are just nice to handle uh, when scoring doughs. And it's just placed over a single razor. So I'm going to put a little bit of ornamental scoring. This dough is more ambient in its temperature in the sense that uh, my fridge does not seem to cool it as well as my walk-in does. I can tell just by its texture. Uh, so I'm being a little bit more gentle with my scoring than I would uh, at the bakery. So there's my score. Don't handle the other side of the Dutch oven with your hands. Uh, it is very hot. And this is going into a 500 degree oven. Normally we don't bake at 500 degrees, but I'm assuming that my home oven is not quite as efficient at holding heat as my bakery ovens are, which it's not. Uh, once I open that giant door, I've just lost a lot of my heat. Uh, and so I set it intentionally higher so that it does hold enough of a temperature. High 400s is a pretty common baking temperature for artisan bread. 20 minutes is the timer that I set for this. After 20 minutes, I'm gonna pull the lid off and develop the crust. So this is like steam in, uh, and then I'm going to release the steam after 20 minutes. It's as easy as that. So I have some uh, rice flour here that I didn't use on this particular loaf. Right before you go to bake, you've seen us load ovens before uh, throughout our channel. And you're often seeing that our loaves have this kind of white uh, top to them. It's made with rice flour, and so rice flour doesn't typically absorb moisture very quickly. So it stays you know, on the surface. And it provides a beautiful contrast on the loaf. So I did that ornamental scoring. And normally, if I put rice flour on the surface of the loaf before I do it, then basically the ornamental scoring contrasts with the rice flour. You have a dark outline of whatever it is that you score surrounded by a white background. And uh, it looks really nice on the final loaf. The downside of using rice flour is that you don't often get the blistering. And so if you see uh, this loaf of bread, which was baked without rice flour at the bakery, you can see all these blisters that formed on the outer crust. Typically with the rice flour, these blisters seem to be a little bit muted. So that's the, that's the one downside. So the rice flour really is optional and used mostly as an aesthetic. It doesn't have an impact on quality one way or the other unless you have some great opposition to the use of rice flour. Uh, but that's, that's how that goes. So you don't have to use it. I chose not to in this case, but I am gonna use the rice flour for other portions of the process as you saw us do during shaping always. Because as I put the loaf in the banneton, the rice flour barrier is what prevents it from sticking. If I didn't have this rice flour, as you saw me turn the loaf over, oftentimes without rice flour what happens, especially without this linen, which is almost the step between uh, a bare banneton. If you have a bare banneton, and a loaf with no rice flour, then often you turn it over and it just stays. And then you're worried about damaging it as you try to pry it out of the, the banneton. So rice flour was a really nice thing that we discovered along the way as we were learning. Uh, and I always have it at the bakery, although it's not critical for this uh, final stage of, uh, of scoring and baking the loaves. It's a much gentler timer than the bakery timers. So it's been 20 minutes now. I'm gonna pull my Dutch oven. I'm gonna rotate this to try to get it off. So that's 20 minutes in. You can see now that the loaf has had quite a bit of oven spring. It's got a nice ear to it. It's still pretty light in color. And so now I'm gonna put it back in the oven but before I do, notice the shine. If you can see here past the score, there's a shine on that inner part, which 
is indicative of the steam that was released. Without steam, the whole loaf would look ashy in color and wouldn't have any kind of shine whatsoever. So now we're going back in. And when I reset my timer, I actually turned off my oven, but I'm gonna bring it. It was already preheated to 500, so don't be too worried for me. I'm just gonna bring it to 440 now. I probably wouldn't have bothered to adjust the temperature if I hadn't accidentally turned it off, but now that it's uncovered, I'm gonna give it more of a gentle finish and set a timer for 10 minutes. Right now, my main priority with this dough is to get the color that I want at the finish. I like my loaves just a little bit on the darker end. You might not want to take it as far as I do, and that's fine. When you're baking at home, you get to choose. I would say though, uh, as a baker, that if you think you don't like darker overall finishes to your loaf, at least try it one time. Because I convince people pretty much every day of this uh, at the bakery. Uh, somebody comes up and says, hey, this looks a little dark. Uh, I'll cut that loaf for them and give them a slice uh, because you only get like this much crust and the little bit of char sometimes actually adds a really interesting and nuanced flavor to the rest of the crumb. Uh, I don't like my loaves terribly dark either, uh, but I like a nice uh, brown, just a nice, nice brown. I'm not golden brown, but just brown. I don't want it black, I want it brown. So, so my timer just went off and I'm ready to pull this loaf out of the oven. It's looking really nice. Here it is final loaf. I can now take it out. Got a decent color on both ends. And I'm going to go ahead and stick a thermometer in it. I'm not really doing this for any other reason than to show you guys. I'm very confident in uh, the fact that it's fully baked. But 180 and above and typically it's going to finish out. A little over 200 is considered done. Like two, 205. This one is temping 208 and yeah, 208 and a half. So definitely done on the inside. Uh, you can also give it a tap and, and it should have like this kind of hollow thud to it. And that's how you know that it's done. So I'm gonna set this aside. It's going to need to cool for a little while before we can handle it. Uh, loaves still bake for a number of hours uh, after they're done and coming out of the oven. It's they're curing. Uh, depending on the style of loaf, you might need even more time. So a rye loaf, for instance, needs a longer cure up to pretty much the whole day. Versus, versus a wheat loaf, I like to give it at least two to three hours of cooling. Uh, so yeah, if, I, if you give it the two to three hours, it's a lot easier to uh, interact with. And it still is building flavor. So right now it's really hot. And if you were to eat it right now, it would have a single texture and really a single just hot flavor. Uh, maybe that's what you're after and that's fine. You know, I'm not going to stop you from eating hot bread, but you're going to taste all the different nuance of the loaf, uh, the flour composition that we use after it's fully cooled down. So behold the final loaf. We have gotten it to cool a little bit. It's easy to handle now. I'm just going to cut it straight down the middle and take a look at how this came out. You can hear the crackle of the fresh crust. And there is the inside crumb. Uh, so I, I guess I just want to take some time to address what you're looking at. Uh, what you're looking for in a sourdough loaf is all of these fermentation sites. And then the crumb will tell you a whole lot about how the fermentation went. It's like a record, a historical record of basically the baker's work. We cut our loaves in half to judge ourselves, really. In, in reality, you know, to eat it, it's kind of stupid to cut it straight in the middle uh, and then be left with two halves, uh, both aging. So I've been yelled at over the years by Amanda over and over again for cutting loaves in half like this. Um, but notice that the crumb it has an even fermentation, meaning you don't see giant holes with really dense pockets, but rather you see 
a lot of really small holes that are expanded to roughly the same level all around. That shows that the loaf has been evenly fermented over a long period of time. The key telltale signs of an under-fermented loaf would be giant holes next to really densely uh, clumped together dough that doesn't look like it's expanded much at all. Anywhere past that is pretty good fermentation, ranges from shaping style to shaping style. So the tighter you shape uh, and the more you fold, the more evenly distributed all your fermentation sites are going to be. We are not, as a bakery, and I am not as a baker, really after that like really open crumb structure, which some people are, and there's reasons for it. Uh, people really love the open crumb structure, especially bakers. Uh, this one is not closed by any means. This loaf is really airy. So uh, I'm going to cut another slice of it here. And while I am, I guess I'll address the knife. Notice how this knife has this... Uh, this kind of inverse angle to it. And it's part of what makes it a pretty nice bread knife to use. The straight ones, for me at least, are a lot harder to manage. Uh, so you can see, now that you see a full slice, that there's elements of the slice, even though it's quite thick, that are translucent. If I cut it even thinner, that, that effect will be exaggerated. So there's enough openness in this in this loaf to where when I spread butter on it, it like catches in all of these nooks and crannies. And you can spread more of anything, but it's not that these holes are big enough that things are just gonna fall right through. That's the balance that I'm personally seeking in, in bread. And since I have this final loaf, I'll take the opportunity to discuss how to store it. So I have this really cool bread bag here uh, that I picked up at our favorite bakery in Durango, Colorado, simply titled Bread. Uh, and they, they had this locally made. Uh, it's just like a linen cloth um, and it's handmade, which is pretty cool. Uh, but you can shop and store your bread in something like this. So typically I'll just wrap my loaf on the counter and set it down. Um, this particular loaf of bread that I have in here is older now, but because it's been in here, it's still soft. See if I have anything that's even older. I, I, after all, do have a bakery, so sometimes I have different ages of bread lying around. I think this one's even older in my bread box. I don't know if a lot of people know that you can do this, but this loaf, which is still soft on the inside, but perhaps a little bit less desirable than this fresh one. See how this one's just got that eggshell crisp to it, and this one no longer does. I can take water and brush it on the crust. Pretty liberally. To the point that it looks about as shiny as the freshly baked one. Then I can stick this in a hot oven for 10 minutes, maybe a little bit less, depending on how hot your oven is. I happen to have a very hot one. And this is called refreshing your loaf. It's a way of getting a loaf that's four to five days old to have this feel for one more time. It's a magic trick that works once. That whole end piece will now be great to consume but you won't really be able to do it again so it's one last like breath of life into your loaf and it really makes for a great experience uh, if you don't know what to do with that loaf that's just a little bit older than you might like but that is the final product of all this work when you bake at home uh, you're stepping into time and doing something that used to be done in almost every household uh, in a huge swath of the world. It's a tradition that connects you uh, with, with a vital food source that throughout history has been representative of a huge percentage of our calorie intake. And I believe that by taking this process slowly at home and trying to incorporate it into your life in some meaningful way, uh, it is easier to appreciate the differences between long fermented high quality bread 
and the sort of run-of-the-mill industrial bread that now is considered, you know, an enemy of the state. Uh, uh, I, I believe that, well, it's not even that I believe, this style of bread sustained humanity for a really long time and helped us thrive. And nowadays, I think that there is an importance to return to that uh, and stop consuming a bunch of uh, empty calories of industrial bread. I think it's an incredible way to invigorate local communities, whether for commercial or non-commercial reasons. Meaning, if you're watching this video right now and you start baking at home, and you bake more than one loaf at a time like we did today, uh, you know, I, the batch that we did was two. You might not need two loaves of bread at once, but give it to somebody. Surely, you know, there's somebody nearby that would appreciate freshly baked bread that truly can't be bought at the store. You as somebody that might just be doing this for the first time, or maybe you haven't baked a lot uh, in the past, are likely going to create much better bread if you can get a sourdough starter going than anything that you can buy commercially uh, unless you happen to live near uh, an artisan bakery. And if you do, then you can have the best of both worlds. Learn this process, get in touch with it, and once in a while when you don't feel like baking for yourself, you know, go support your local community baker. I hope that this inspires more of you to take up the cause and bake at home and learn about this stuff. I'm gonna eat this now. So how to show a multi-day process all at once. Uh, it actually mimics the flow of the bakery too. So you just saw a process that should extend for an entire day, but you saw it all you know, in one fell swoop. The reality is when you add this into your lifestyle at home, you've gotta find a way to make this flow in the background. So I wanted to break apart everything that you saw here into its various components so we can see how would this apply into your regular life? This was a loaf that I cut open, and this is a loaf that we baked off just a few hours ago at the bakery this morning. Uh, this is a loaf that I just pulled out of the oven that we baked off here. It was also shaped earlier today uh, at the bakery. So this was a mix from yesterday baked off this morning. This was shaping that happened earlier this morning put into the refrigerator and then baked off for you guys. So this would have been yesterday's mix, you know, in the fridge, ready to bake off in the morning. Uh, and then this is the dough that we hand mixed that in its regular course of life will be ready to bake tomorrow morning. So I have all the stages all at once. And now the key is, okay, how do you put this together at home? So. I'm folding this dough and it's in its process. I'm getting to it, setting it aside back into its warm place, then getting at it for another few minutes and setting it aside. And the same thing happened before with the mix. I did the auto lease for a few minutes, set it aside for 20. So really, if you're at home for the day, sourdough baking is a great thing to take up in the background. You can get your auto lease going and you can set it aside in a warm place for even two hours. You don't need, don't think 20 minutes, that's a minimum number. Two hours is actually really nice. And it gives you time to, I don't know, run an errand or, you know, cook a meal or, you know, do the laundry or take your kids to school or, you know, whatever it is that you have going on in your life. Uh, so you can set it aside and, and do that thing. I'm just like I'm going to right now set this aside back into its warm place. Then when you come back to it, and you come back to it a couple times, you're gonna go uh, and shape that dough and put it in the fridge. Then just go about the rest of your day, and perhaps in the morning you can bake, but perhaps you also want to get the next batch of dough started. So you can find a rhythm, and that's really what this is all about. That's how bakeries work. You've gotta find a rhythm that's a much smaller scale, unless you, know, you plan on becoming a commercial baker. But I wanted to point out another thing that was hard to see in the video. If you go back to where I scored this loaf of bread that I baked in the Dutch oven, you probably noticed that it wasn't a very crisp score, that basically my blade was getting caught a little bit more. And it's because we came from the bakery, we brought this dough that had been formed into a loaf 
only a few hours ago. Uh, and I kept it at ambient intentionally because I didn't have the time to let it ferment overnight. Instead, I kept it at that 84 degrees for a longer period and let it fully ferment, fully proof. Then I stuck it in the fridge in hopes of cooling it down a little before baking it. And also to show you what it would be like to do it at home. Your loaf at home should turn out a little bit closer to this one, in fact, because if your loaf is ambient when you score it, it's just simply harder to score. And it's not going to come up with as crisp of a overall feel. Some bakers swear by ambient only baking because you keep all the energy. What's interesting is this loaf by volume is a little bit bigger than this loaf in terms of overall size. And it's because cooling the process down slows it down. So the crumb structure of this one uh, might be actually a little bit more closed. This is a very hot loaf of bread that I pulled out of the oven less than 20 minutes ago. And because I have no particular uh, thing that I need to do with this bread, it's not for sale, I'll cut it early and show you. You can see the difference in a loaf of bread that's still hot. You can see that it, it has a different overall texture to it. You can see the steam literally coming out of it. It hasn't fully set in yet. It, at this stage is not going to have the, the full spectrum of flavor yet. The texture is going to be different entirely. Not necessarily bad, but it's actually not my preference. I'd much rather eat this loaf that's a few hours old than this loaf that's 20 minutes old. But you'll notice that the crumb structure, if you can see past the fact that I was dragging this hot dough still with the knife, and so it's not as crisp as a result, you can though see that it's got more openness in spots than this one does. And that's a factor of its ambient uh, final proof as a result of the circumstances today versus the typical cold ferment that this one got. So just some little compare and contrast at the end. I thought it was fun to show you guys how this all came together in a short period of time, but also to use this as an example to set the stage for building rhythms around your baking or as we call in the bakery, flows. For us, it's a matter of stacked baking interventions. So we go from, say, doing something with English muffins immediately to sourdough, immediately to croissant dough. When you're at home, you can replicate the same background rhythm where the microbes are doing most of the work and you are that observant, that alchemist that's coming in with staged interventions. Uh, you're strengthening the dough, you're guiding it along, you're bringing it to where you want it to be ultimately, but you're letting the microbes ferment in the background and do all this work over an extended period of time. Your stacked interventions are whatever your life is, you know, whether it be sleep overnight after you feed your sourdough starter or preparing breakfast in between folds, you know, whatever it is, you can build this into your lifestyle. Even if you work, you can absolutely build a sourdough rhythm into your lifestyle. It's a 24 hour cycle. Uh, whether you choose to bake every day or not is then the next step. Uh, if you don't wanna bake every day, you can set your sourdough starter aside in the fridge, no problem. Just like I said earlier, make sure to feed it a couple times before you mix your, your dough again. So anyway, that's how we put this all together with the multiple stages in the background. Hope you had a good time watching us.